let me start by saying this. When you get a PhD in clinical or counseling psychology, you, you kind of have two career options. One is to study some topic of interest in school and then parlay that research into an academic career. And the other option is to graduate and go into private practice. Th that's kind of it, which is why I'm so fascinated by people that are able to break the mold and do something different with that clinical or counseling background, which is why I was so excited to interview Dr. Drea Letamende, who has cultivated, I think, the most creative psychology career I've ever seen. She is a well-being coach, a behavioral health consultant for UCLA. She's, she's the co-host of the Arkham Sessions podcast, which is about the psychology of Batman. She has She's done a talk for TEDx, she contributes to fandom, she's been to Comic-Con, all with the goal of making mental health digestible for everybody. All right, Drea, tell me about Batman. Why is Batman so important to you as a psychologist? Batman is, in my mind, kind of an entry point for the profession of psychology. And the reason why that worked for me is that when I was a kid, I watched this show called Batman the Animated Series. It was um, a show that aired in the early 90s and really had so many novel elements to, towards storytelling that I think for a lot of us growing up around that time, we hadn't seen before. The elements of detective work, of course, specific to this superhero, lended itself toward understanding people, being kind of person-centered showing villains in dynamic ways that went above and beyond, oh, this person just does bad things. It answered the question, how do life experiences shape psychology, shape mental health, shape behavior? And for a cartoon, essentially this like cartoon for kids, that was groundbreaking. Uh, others will comment on the creative and art, artistic elements of the animated series. Um, but for me, it was really the psychology and the depth of the storytelling. And I didn't know it at the time, but it, it certainly led me to ask questions about human behavior and the detective work that we do in predicting behavior, understanding behavior, um, deepening our own self-awareness. And I know this sounds like quite a lot to say about a kid's show. But years later, I went into the field of psychology. I pursued a PhD. I um, specialized in clinical psychology. And Batman as a character came back to me uh, in terms of realizing and honoring that entry point, realizing that I had cared about this field I didn't go into psychology right away. Like, like many professionals, I started as a computer scientist and I was heavy into math and thought, you know, I'm going to do other things. And when I came back to psychology, I realized like, no, I've, I think I've always been drawn to human behavior from the very beginning and wanting to be my own detective around this. How can I contribute to the deepening of our understanding of these things and even improve our society in some way? Um, and then lastly, in the, uh, in the year 2010, 2011, the writer of the Batgirl comic included a character who was a psychologist and she reached out to me. I was doing a little bit of consulting at the time and she reached out to me and said, you know, she wanted to create this therapeutic relationship between the superhero Batgirl and a counselor and she really wanted to uplift the recovery process following this mm -hmm. really critical trauma that this character experienced. And we went through some uh, kind of collective uh, creative process around that. And she ended up writing in the character of the psychologist and naming the character after me and having my likeness and including that in the comic book. And, and that was such an affirming kind of, uh, resolution or affirming closure for me around like, okay, I think this is where I'm meant to be. That is, uh, I, I have so many, I, I don't know where to start. I've got so many questions. So let me, <laughs> let yeah. me start with, so my experience in getting a doctorate in psychology was that there is a, 
there is a well-worn path in academia. Like there's a well-worn path to becoming a psychologist and how you, how you apply for those programs, how you interview for those programs, how you present what your dissertation is going to be in those programs and what you want to do. And, and yeah, I remember thinking when I was applying, whatever I do professionally, when I share that with the, you know, the, the committee, it better serve the organ, the university. Otherwise they're not going to want to bring me on. Sure. And so I have all my frustration, honestly, my first, one of my frustrations with the APA is I feel like it is this sort of, um, it, it's a, it's a blunting force on creativity. I feel like people don't do what they really want to do because they're sort of like, this is what I do. I go through, I'm going to go do a pre-doc internship and a post-doc internship, and then I'm going to get a job at a counseling center. You know what I mean? There's a very, and you have totally bucked the system, it seems with that. So how did you, like, at what point did you go, Hey, I imagine at some point they said, what do you want to study? And you would have had creative answers to that. Or did that come after? I appreciate your honesty about our profession in a wide sense, right? The, the seemingly narrow pathways to get to a point of um, practicing psychology. And, you know, first, let me say that achieving all of those milestones is such hard work, right? And it's not to say that we shouldn't be following those um, those directions, but it's that the there seems to be a, a lacking of diverse pathways in this field. And so for you to share that frustration, I think is like in many ways a relief for people to hear, for me especially. And, and I, I started my uh, journey professionally with, a, I would say, a, a, a pretty intentional mindset around, I'm probably going to, you know, finish grad school, do an internship somewhere, and then do research at a university. In, in the first few mm -hmm. years of my uh, graduate school experience, that was sort of the, the idea. That was, that was the plan. And the more, it's so interesting that it, it gets narrower and narrower. Like your choices actually begin to, to, uh, narrow even more. Um, really in the sense that you're expected to kind of choose an, an area of study or focus and then, you know, uh, really cultivate that work. And again, we can't, I can't do the work that I do without that necessary foundational, um, research that happens. Um, mm -hmm. but the first thing that, that I would say is, uh, a, fork in the road is that I started to uh, serve as a public health educator, like really early on um, in the first few years of my graduate school experience, I started to um, steer away from the APA conferences and go mm -hmm. toward other types of conferences that don't have the access to the stuff that you and I hear all the time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think my colleagues need to hear about stuff that actually, you know, they can access pretty easily through articles and textbooks and, and um, peer exchange. And one thing that I really recognized in, in this work was the gatekeeping of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of information in our field. And I thought, um, you know, there's really little reason for that. I want this work to be accessible and open and available to people. And so I started yeah, can to go. You say, what you, say more about gatekeeping. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, anything from the, uh, the costs of accessing like journal articles, chapters, mm -hmm. um, information to attending conferences and, you know, uh, uh, having a, a deepening of our um, exposure to the state of the science and the frontiers of the science, right? And yeah. um, I'll, I'll just be, I'll be, I'll be more, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute, to try and get access to research is an absolute, not, to, I mean, it really, if you're not in school where they, you have access to JSTOR or whatever it is to get good luck. And it is so expensive to get access to, to really, if you want current research, it's like good luck. I mean, I, I think it's a significant problem. It's a huge problem. And there are reasons for that, um, but this field is not, in my mind, prioritizing availability and access of the science. Now, we do have a tremendous, um, tremendously active uh, landscape of work around um, public health education and 
Um, and those kinds of endeavors, you know, mental health first aid training, um, those kinds of things. But the, there, there seems to be a continued kind of ivory tower mentality around this particular science that, um, has been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's important, you know, again, that this work happens. It's, especially now, it's a huge, uh, I, I'd say it's it's a critical endeavor to continue to include science in our work when we use social media, when we use digital platforms, when we use other more public, um, you know, exchanges and atmospheres, places where these things, these this information may may be shared, especially with the increase of paraprofessionals and other folks who. Um, have social media accounts and talk about their mental health. So it's, just, mm -hmm. it's important for us to be there. Um, but for me, I started to take this work to comic book conventions, pop culture conventions, the places where I saw people like myself, those were my peers. And how can I include psychological science and mental health education in those venues and in those dialogue spaces where creativity is happening, storytelling is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and where entertainment media is being celebrated and widely circulated and that stuff's accessible. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I thought the pathway isn't, isn't the one that's kind of set for us. It's, it's one that I can kind of, um, create and innovate and utilize in a space that I kind of already feel comfortable. And, mm -hmm. and that ended up dovetailing and working out through the rest of my, graduate school experience. And when young people ask me uh, about, you know, should I go into this field or should I get a PhD? My answer is still the same, which is it's so important to obtain the credentials, the degree, the license, the, you know, the different, different tools that you're going to need to create your platform. It, it's mm -hmm. really impossible to skip that. Um, so mm -hmm. how do we harness those tools and those uh, abilities and, and take them into places where you don't really see um, mm -hmm. that work being done. And, and honestly, that's a great joy of mine is to be able to make that work accessible. Yeah. I, I think it is. Yeah, I have a, like a, a kind of like, it sounds like you, you, I have a love hate relationship with, with the APA. I mean, I'm, I couldn't be more proud of myself for having done it. I'm happy I did it. But then if you ask me, like, do you, would you recommend that for other people? I feel very fortunate that I, and I feel like I've ended up in many ways through luck or just fortunate circumstances in a career that I wanted, but it's not the career that I originally signed up for. You know what I mean? And I think a part of that is that the APA is by nature pretty rich. I think it is so well-intentioned as far as why people get into clinical work that it's easy. You're sort of selecting a population of people that by nature isn't going to be super entrepreneurial, isn't going to be pushing back on getting paid, a, a, you know, a low salary, isn't going to, be, there's, it's like you have these people that are really well-intentioned. And I took me a long time to sort of pick my head up and go, Hey, I don't know that this is what I want to do. You know what I mean? And I don't know that the APA fosters compared to if you were to get a, a degree to get an MBA, they would be fostering creativity and Hey, what can you, what is your unique interest yes. that you could you know what I mean? And we don't do that very well. So well put, you know, how can you forge your path where you mm -hmm. as a professional are uniquely creating your brand, creating your practice, um, taking what works and making it your own. Uh, our field tends to, um, you know, ignore or minimize the importance of um, public speaking, media education, um, business, uh, uh, mm -hmm. business education. And I, I think that's kind of a, you know, it's terrible. It's, it's a missed opportunity because I think a lot of us can have these, um, you know, these interactions, these platforms, these ways to, um, to improve our field. And, you know, let me just add to, cause, um, some folks have, have asked, you know, um, do you still go to, uh, psychology conferences, do you still still speak with uh, mental health professionals, practitioners? And I, I do all the time because um, I think a part of this work is that liaisonship. A part of this work is mm -hmm. the bridge 
And it's it warms my heart when an audience member at Comic-Con uh, comes to me and says, like, your panel or your presentation encouraged me to pursue psychology because of the work that you're doing. And yeah. I love that because it reminds me that, you know, uh, we need to continue to work on healthy recruitment of mm -hmm. scientists, researchers, practitioners, um, folks that are going to be in this field, you know, after I'm done. And, and that I think is what's fulfilling, um, as a part of this work. And you use, so just so I make sure I understand what you're, you're doing is part, part of it just is you are, you're, you're looking at looking at characters and you're profiling them from a psychological standpoint. And you're also using that as an object to help people be more resilient in the face of distress, trauma, whatever it might be. Am I tracking that? Yeah, right? I, I think, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great um, capturing of what I do. Generally speaking, I utilize pop culture and mediated others, mediated fictional characters to help us learn more about our mental health, to enhance our well-being, um, and to build resilience. And and that can happen in a number of different ways. Um, sometimes I feel like maybe I have too much on my plate, but it's it's so much fun to do it. But one way that I do that is through a podcast called The Arkham Sessions. And The Arkham Sessions started out as a deep dive into the animated series, the, the show that I was just talking about. And into the psychology of Batman and um, and the characters that surround his story. And after over 100 episodes, um, my co-host and I moved on to other shows, other films, and other genres, actually. We started with Batman, and then we moved into um, other DC sh comics shows. And then we moved into this, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and now we're covering Star, Star Wars. So we're, we're really kind of covering... Um, the pop culture map, which is a lot of fun. The podcast mm -hmm. is one way that I take fictional stories and storytelling and then amplify and speak to topics of mental health and psychological science. And you so, know, so you might, so just for, just to make, just walk me through it. So for, yeah. let's just say we're doing Batman. So you would say, um, he lost his parents, experienced this traumatic event, and then you're working with your client and saying, "How? Let's look at how Batman responded to that trauma." Not at all. Oh, never. <laughs> that yeah, okay. and it's such a good question because it's like, what does yeah. this mean? How does this translate into a podcast? So I don't have a private practice. I don't see clients. Um, my clients are organizations, companies, nonprofits, and so I serve as a behavioral health advisor. For them, and we could talk about that too. Mm -hmm. For what I do for the podcast and Comic Con panels, presentations, workshops, is that we start with maybe the story, the character, um, the the critical event, right? And then what I do is I talk about the psychological pieces and behavioral patterns and outcomes of that experience that we all saw on screen. We have a okay. shared, so when I say like mediated others, well, I have a shared experience of what it's like to uh, connect over a story that isn't our own. And we see this, Batman the Animated Series is one example, but we see this in Game of Thrones. We see this in The Sandman. We see this in Moon Knight. We see this in She-Hulk, you know, the number of shows that have connected us um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is one of the longest running storytelling uh, genres around characters and figures that we've been connected to for over a decade. So when things happen to those characters, we have collective grief, collective trauma. We experience this mediated emotional process. Mm. So to answer your question more directly, on the podcast, it's not really about how do you do this with clients? It's how does this story teach us more about psychological science that could be helpful for all of us. Um, trauma recovery, um, disrupted relationships, attachments, um, you know, parenting. It, we've done so many episodes that it really has a wide coverage. And uh, the, these kinds of stories really lend themselves to really um, opening up 
a wide, mm -hmm. diverse array of, of topics that we can talk about. And that then becomes a podcast really about mental health education. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that um, for several years. I, I think we're almost in our 10th year with this podcast. Wow. And the Congratulations. Th thank you. Yeah, the feedback has been um, uh, one of two things. Um, typically, the feedback has been, you know, thank you for making this stuff available and, and make it approachable. Help me understand um, diagnoses like uh, clinical depression or bipolar disorder. Help me understand certain treatments, trauma-informed mm -hmm. care, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. And we do that in a way that isn't like a lecture, but it's a conversation because my co-host is not a psychologist. He's uh, essentially a pop culture historian and, and bring, brings in those pieces of the story. The, the second thing that comes up for, uh, for my listeners is a great amount of um, destigmatization and feeling inclu included mm -hmm. um, and even asking some questions about the field of psychology. Again, there's that recruitment piece. So there's a lot of elements here that break down barriers and, um, the, and, and minimizes that gatekeeping that I talked about. The, the right. stuff that we know, we can, we can share that information. We can um, uh, include that information and uh, translate that information in ways that are not just educational, but actually uh, enjoyable, actually change people's perspectives, actually helps them through difficult and challenging situations in their lives. And, and so it sort of becomes this like, entertainment podcast with a little bit of, um, a, a little bit of like resilience building and self-care. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a part of me and I don't mean to, I, maybe I'm keep distorting it back the wrong direction, but there's a part of me that feels like it's such a creative way to get people to look more objectively at the emotions that they can experience in their lives. You know, because a lot of times when you experience an emotion, or, or something traumatic happens to you, it's hard to wrap your head around what that is. But I think if you see it happen to somebody else, somebody that you identify with, then I would imagine that the, you get a different lens on it that might help you process through your own experience. Absolutely. Is that a fair way of describing that? I think it is. And there are multiple reasons why this method works when it comes to increasing health consciousness, mental health consciousness, which, mm -hmm. which is what you just captured uh, so clearly. The idea that through these mediated stories, we can enhance our own interpersonal effectiveness, grow self-aware, work on our mm -hmm. own development. That's all of us. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just for folks who need or, or are in therapy. Um, there's also an engagement piece that is very different from therapy. Uh, this piece is the joy and connectivity, the parasocial connection that we have with fictional characters. And with some folks, that can be a very strong bond, um, relating to a fictional character in ways that you can't maybe, you know, access or understand in IRL, right? Or, or with, with, mm -hmm. um, with real uh, non-fictional people. And there's something vulnerable about that. Maybe it's the ability to get closer to those emotions um, that you may be closed off to if, if it's in person or if, it, if it's, sorry, if it's a, a real person. person. Mm -hmm. um, that level of creativity, of enjoyment, of play, of um, kind of opening up your, your own self-awareness to a fictional character is unique to that mediated other this mm -hmm. has been studied. A, a huge amount of studies came out after the show Friends ended. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but a lot of people were bummed that the show Friends went off yeah, the air. I was bummed. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, uh, what did we do? So, psychologists ran studies and they found that the sadness, the grief, the feeling of being adrift and disconnected that fans felt were very, like, viscerally close to the emotions after real breakups. Of course there's That's differences, but but those res that research reminds us that these relationships, although they are unidirectional, although they are clearly fictional, these are non-delusional 
connections to fictional characters. There's some element of, uh, there's some realness to that, a, a real bond there. Yeah, that's fascinating. That That is fascinating. I, I was, when you were talking and when I, I, I have never been, I cannot get interested in comics like ever. And I, 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 you were talking, I was going, I don't know. I wonder why I struggle so much if it's a lack of imagination or what it is, but I cannot, I mean, I've never watched, I've never gotten through an episode of star Wars. I just can't, I cannot do it. I've, I, I never watched any of the Marvel universe. I just can't, it's just too far out there for me. But friends, I loved yeah. friends and absolutely felt that when that went away. And I don't know why I was able to. So when you said that, I go, oh, yeah, I totally can relate to that piece of it. But I don't feel that, you know what I mean? With like with Batman, for example, sure. I like that react, that experience that you had. I didn't. I don't. Do you have any sense of why that why some people connect more than others? It, it I think it really depends on the person's. um fantastical repertoire, you know, what, uh, there are oh, some like people, that that's a good <laughs> phrase, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I say that cause, um, look during the, during the pandemic, we had, um, many ways to take care of ourselves, but the consumption of media in particular entertainment media was a huge coping mechanism for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. it didn't mean that all of us were watching star Wars. Um, some mm -hmm. people were watching soaps. Some people were um, uh, watching old shows that they used to grow up, that they grew up on, right? That nostalgic factor. Uh, and what we know about that, this, this um, uh, attraction or, or connection to entertainment media when we're in crisis is we're kind of looking for the, that emotional storytelling that's going to give us calmness, resolution, um, a place for our uncertainty. And this is why I'm answering your question this way is that some people were leaning in. So there's a lean mm -hmm. in and there's a lean mm -hmm. back kind of entertainment. So mm -hmm. lean in entertainment is the kind of entertainment that's you're just going to get consumed in, you know, you're going to lose your, uh, almost your, your sense of self. You're kind of, um, it's an escapism experience. Uh -huh. And the lean back entertainment is I'll have this on, I'll have this TV show, I'll have this cooking show on or this home renovation show on or this soap opera on um, just to kind of fill the void, just to kind of be in the space with me while mm -hmm. I wash the dishes or while I, uh, you know, uh, multitask or maybe while I just sit back and zone out. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's different ways in which we consume uh, entertainment media. Uh, but what's interesting and what I found particularly fascinating when it comes to coping and dealing with, um, uh, dealing with trauma is that the folks that were drawn to horror and the folks that had already had, uh, a, an affinity to horror, there was some pre-existing element of resilience to their, um, to their coping so, and it makes some sense if we kind of unpack that, right? People yeah, who... I am fascinated. People, <laughs> people say that. So people that yeah. before the pandemic were interested in horror had built in resilience. Yes. And it's because they had been practicing, experiencing, working through these emotions that now have become real uncertainty, fear, phobia, um, the, the, uh, crisis panic, you know, the things that are common elements in thriller suspense and horror genres. And, um, there's a fear lab actually in Europe that just specifically looks at this work. And they found that, um, fans of horror had better coping skills around the pandemic in particular. And it was as if they had this repertoire with them already um, being okay with uncertainty, uh, being okay with being scared, knowing that it's okay to be not okay. Uh, now it's not everybody. And certainly there are people who aren't horror fans who have healthy coping skills. Uh, but I found that to be a, a, an affirming piece of evidence to help us understand that we do turn to entertainment media 
some of us to work out the uncertainty, the fear, uh, mm -hmm. the, the scariness of something. And some of us, uh, because we are, we have that practice within our emotional, um, uh, mindset and we are turning to something that's familiar to us. The story, whether it's one we've seen before a million times or new, or it's new to us has a beginning, middle and end. There is a satisfaction around that resolution, that package. And so mm -hmm. for many of us going to stories that maybe even were kind of, um, dark or, uh, dystopian during the pandemic, it's not as if we wanted to continue our misery. It's that there was a certain, a sense of certainty and closure about that story. And then furthermore, this speaks to the characters and stories that the observation and um, vicarious alignment with coping is helpful to us too. How does that character, mm -hmm. how does Luke Skywalker figure out his problems? How does Moon Knight work through the, uh, the challenges, the obstacles, the confusion he feels in his world when he feels so fragmented? Um, and I'd even say that Friends has elements of that too. How does this group of, of, of people problem solve these everyday quirks and, um, and interpersonal obstacles that they experience? And, and that's kind of satisfying for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would if you had asked me, would there be a relationship between watching horror movies? I would have said, and resiliency. I would have said, absolutely not. But it makes, but it makes sense, intellectual sense that. I mean, I think in many ways that resiliency is built through exposure. Right? You have you have to prove to yourself that you can overcome something. You have to prove to yourself that you're okay when you're experiencing distress. And so I get. I mean, if you think about it that way, when you're watching a horror movie, you are you're flexing that muscle, right? You're uncomfortable, which is why, by the way, I don't like horror movies because I don't want to flex right. that muscle. And so right. I just get, I go, this is uncomfortable. I'm going to watch friends. Right. But, but you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, that's yeah and, fascinating. And, you know, let me add to for folks who don't like horror, there is that element of positive dissociation, maybe with a show like friends, positive mm -hmm. dissociation, mm -hmm. meaning I'm kind of, you know, um, able to separate myself from my current situation with something that's lighthearted or distracting, um, but probably not too meaningful for me. Right. Uh, and that's also a healthy practice too. We, we can't always be heavy in our emotions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's almost as if we're um, just like with Netflix or Disney Plus or any one of these streaming channels, we kind of have a menu in front of us of the way that the type of entertainment, but also the way we want to interact with our entertainment. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's a, when I work with clients, one of the things I, I try and encourage them to do is be really intentional about what strategy they're using, right? There are, there are times when you want to intentionally grieve or intentionally expose yourself to something. And there are times when you want to intentionally check out and being able to use that menu in a way that is thoughtful, I think is exceptionally important for people as we're coming through something mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. There's some agency to that. Right, right. Yeah. So how do you, so how do you use this with organizations? Great question. Um, so a couple of ways. Uh, I have partnered with some entertainment media companies to bring this work um, to the screen. Uh, so that could involve documentaries, uh, featurettes, um, bonus features, things where you might see uh, similar to a lot of YouTube channels where you might see somebody comment on the um, accuracy, the realness, the uh, elements of this field in a story, in a fictional story, mm -hmm. like a television show or a film. And um, one of the relationships I have is actually with DC Comics Warner Brothers. And when they uh, release a film or actually um, when they released some of the box sets of the tele television series that they used to run on the CW, they'd have me come in and, and talk about relationships, trauma, uh, loss, grief, recovery, treatment, um, mental illness. And they'll package that in a way that it accompanies the story. So you watch the story or, or you, you're 
drawn into the story. And then there might be an interview with me or commentary or some interaction wow. where someone may recognize like, oh, this person isn't explaining how to how to interpret the story necessarily, but they're explaining uh, why this works or they're explaining why I feel a certain way when watching this. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, it's almost sort of like, uh, you know, similar to the podcast, but specific to what that entertainment media company wants to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I've partnered with um, with those kinds of companies. I've partnered with uh, video game developers. I'm working on something right now where there's a, a horror video game coming out. And the marketing for that, we'll be talking about like why we love horror so much. What is it psychologically oh, that connects us uh -huh. to horror, which I obviously I love talking about. Um, and that's how, you know, again, this work can be um, amplified and 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 really highly visible in places where you know typically you, you might see it at a conference or you might see it on a poster or at a, at a discussion somewhere. I t I tend to not bring my work to science conventions because I'm not sure that's where I'm the most impactful. I'm I'm the bridge. I'm the translator. I'm supposed to take this work elsewhere. God, I think you would. At an APA conference, I feel like you would be the most popular person there. I mean, maybe. <laughs> That's so kind. I, just, I would, Hold on. I think it would, I think it might frustrate some people that have that, that have just had one view of how to do it. But whenever I go to one of those conferences, I, it always feels like the same. We're just sort of rehashing the same content. We're making a small little tweak on it, but it's the same sort of fundamental view on whatever it is. And what you're talking about is such a creative way of absolutely disseminating. I mean, certainly you're disseminating information in a, new, in a unique way, but also it requires a, a high level of cognitive agility on your part to be able to look at a, a, a comic character and, and you know, you're, you're, you're having to really work with your knowledge to be able to do that in an effective way. I appreciate you know, that. It, I think it, that's... It's... Um... I feel sometimes a little bit uh, sorry for my husband who has to sit through every television show, every fr film where I'm like, oh, that's not real. That's real. This is what that is. This is a mental disorder. This is, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it almost comes naturally where with a fictional character, there's so much room to kind of expand on the um uh, kind of the behavioral patterns and mm -hmm. the suggestions around a uh, diagnostic profile. And we don't do that with real people, right? Like we, we can make some conjecture and, and, and certainly there are some high profile people in the news uh, who display some wild characterological things mm -hmm. and, and people ask us about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are people that, that can speak to that. Um, my realm is the fantasy realm where mm -hmm. There's more space for me to even say, this is what we saw. And then, and then what if it were this? What if it right. were, uh, an, you know, an, another behavioral pattern or, or what if this person were to receive treatment? What, mm -hmm. what would that look like? And, and it allows for a, sorry to interrupt, but it yeah. allows for a much more, I would imagine, transparent discussion on your part. So for me, so for me on my YouTube channel, I often am reacting to what I think is happening with some real person. Yeah. But I have to be real careful that that's a real person. I can't go on there and be like, this is the diagnosis, yes, right? Because I've not met that person. And so I feel like I am often saying, here's based on the data that I have access to, but I'm, I'm hedging and qualifying it, right? Versus you can go the other way where you can say, if it was this, it could look like this. If it, you know what I mean? You could be, I feel like you can be all in on it, which I imagine creates a much more dynamic conversation. I think there's a lot of space for both, right? Because a lot mm -hmm. of people um, wonder and are curious about real public figures. Uh, I think it's important for us to be in that space versus paraprofessionals or, or folks who um, don't have the expertise to speak on those things because, you know, everybody's talking about those things. Uh, the ability to take an origin story or one episode or one um, character, uh, um, you know, snapshot, and then expand on their psychology is, it, 
definitely, I'd say it's a ton of fun because I can bring in all of this different um, evidence-based science mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. to the dialogue. Um, but it allows me to 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 have what I think is that depth of um, work that then more people who are probably not in our field can have access to. So something mm-hmm. that I do is I, I write for a company called Fandom and uh, they'll choose a character, the fictional character from mm-hmm. a film or, or television show. And I'll take the, the information that we see from that episode or from that film. And then I'll create this long kind of like psychoanalytic uh, profile. Mm-hmm. And half of it is what I gathered from what I watched, but half of it is, uh, what we know from, from this field, um, had this been antisocial personality disorder, what else would that include? Well, it would Mm -hmm. also include narcissism. It would also include lack of empathy would also include propensity toward violence. Uh, and right now when we have a lot of questions around high conflict personalities, narcissism, uh, violence, mass shooting, I can use these fictional characters to be very frank and open about what it is we're looking for without stigmatizing an individual who's real and without making assumptions about people who are, who are, you know, in the news. Yeah. I I read one that you did on Harley Quinn. Yeah. And on, on, that's on, you did that on fandom. fandom, Yeah. 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 Very cool. And what a, what a interesting way to do that. You're right. To talk about those serious events that you can't, that you, you worry about stigmatizing people, but that is a, that is a safe avenue to talk about it. So I'm I'm curious. So if you were talking to somebody that had no sort of exposure to this at all, what, what character is the one that you would encourage them to learn about to start, to to start thinking about psychology through fantasy? I love this question. And this is something that can be done in the therapeutic room because my honest answer would be, what is that person drawn to? Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly I can list a number of characters that I think speaks to mental health and psychology in Mm -hmm. very apparent, very accessible ways. We're actually getting a lot of that in our um, Marvel DC and Disney Plus, uh, Netflix shows, there's just an incredible amount of mm-hmm. material around mental health, ranging from depression to suicide to bipolar disorder. Um, and so it would be really a question of what interests that person? What are they drawn to? And someone may say, you know, I really don't even like entertainment media. I like podcasts or I like to read um you know, novels or children's books or, um, you know, any, any kind of, um, genre or medium may speak to them in different ways. And I I think that's probably what I would encourage them to explore. What is it about Mm -hmm. that, that particular, um, medium or genre or story? And it doesn't have to be fantasy, superheroes, comics, uh, science fiction. It definitely doesn't have to be those things. Um, and I would allow that to kind of help, um, help them explore, um, Mm -hmm. ways to connect to that story or that person or, or that character. Yeah. I think it's interesting, you know, because oftentimes I feel like I am encouraging people to think about somebody other than when you say, when, when people make decisions that you can sort of objectively go, Hey, that seems like a rough choice but they make that choice for them. And so oftentimes I'm trying to say, Hey, imagine if it was somebody else, imagine if it was your son, how would, what would you advise your son to do or what? Right. And, but I'm, but I'm trying to use them. I'm trying to help them distance a little bit to some from themselves to somebody that they care about. But the idea, this is just talking to you and thinking in preparation for this meeting, I was thinking, gosh, what a cool way of helping people think objectively and think positively about about a challenge that's really uh negatively impacting them you know what i mean i mean i think there's yeah Yeah. i'm reminded of um a time that i asked a college student i work at ucla i work with college students daily 
and but not in sorry to interrupt, but not in a clinical capacity. No, uh, in um, in other ways of career advice, training, um, coaching. Uh, I have a I have a position at UCLA that's outside of the the our um, counseling services. So I serve as a consultant, a trainer, and uh, uh, I work with our crisis response teams. And so if uh-huh. there is um, a critical event, a community trauma, a crisis, um, typically I'm involved in um, in the restorative work and in, in the grief and loss work. I, and I work with students directly, sometimes who are in positions of leadership. They themselves are forming trainings or they're um, supervising other students. Um, resident assistants are sort of the main cadre of students that I work with. And I train them. I empower them with counseling skills. And uh, one student had said to me, we had kind of gotten into this conversation of what fictional character they connect to. And mm-hmm. he told me, uh, Johnny Depp's character from the Pirates of the Caribbean. And I just kind of like sh- shook my head. Like, this isn't brand new to me. I don't know why. I don't, I have never even really seen those movies. Mm-hmm. Isn't he drunk the whole time? I just didn't get it. I <laughs> didn't get character. it. Yeah. And I said, you know, tell, tell me more about that. What is it about? Jack Sparrow that you find fascinating. What is it about him that you connect to? And he articulated this, the most heartfelt self-aware description of this. I can't even, you know, parrot it back to you. It was just so, um, so endearing and so soulful and a window into his psychology. I I'll never forget the way that he described this character as kind of being who he wanted to be. He wanted to be Mm -hmm. confident. He wanted to be helpful. He wanted to be subversive. Um, He, you know, and, and in ways that I didn't even realize this character was doing these things Uh, that allowed me to kind of be a little bit more open-minded around, Mm -hmm. you know, what I'm recommending to young people or, or, or other people about their, mediated relationships. Uh, and so for you to say, you know, Friends was maybe a show or, or maybe another sitcom was a show. A lot of people like Seinfeld, a lot of people like mm-hmm. Cheers. I don't really connect to that, but I'm open-minded to, to believe that there's something very meaningful and significant mm-hmm. to those stories. And it's probably contextual. Where were you right. in your life when that story came to you? And how did that story create in you um, encouragement? How did it instill resilience? How did it shape you? How did it, um, make you wonder about things you, you, you know, later pursued? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm just very appreciative of the ability for the context. Right. That's an interesting thing. Cause yeah. So for some people, it's a, it's an interesting question to ask people who they identify with. Cause you're right. For some people, it will be someone that it could be someone that is very different than them, someone that they want to, they aspire to be like, it could be someone that when they watched that or read that or consumed the, inform- the, the, the media made them feel good because of where they were, or it could be someone that they can, they relate to because they've got shared experience. I mean, there's all different kinds of nuances as far as why somebody would connect to a character, but, but all yeah. super valuable from a, from a understanding somebody's psychology standpoint. Yeah, I, I often bring up Star Wars, which is another story that I'm very close to. I, I grew up on science fiction. And um, briefly, I'll say that my father loved science fiction. And so when I was a kid, we would watch um, Alien, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Abyss, Star Wars. And, and there was that bonding that happened mm-hmm. for us um, that I imagine for, that happens for a lot of people when they're growing up. Um, consuming this, this entertainment media. Uh, and, um, I, I realized that some of these stories then later come into my life. The, the story of, um, Luke Skywalker, uh, it's, it's that idea of like, you kind of feel small, you kind of feel, um, in search of, or in quest of significance. You're not really sure what life has in store for you. And you're in this discovery period. And then you realize you could have a, a, an impact on your community. Mm-hmm. You could have, and now for him, he basically saved the universe 
Uh, I don't know that that's the case for any of us, but um, that's science fiction for you. But but the idea that um, those feelings of abandonment, rejection, feeling adrift, feeling lonely, those are things that it's okay for us to connect to, get close to, and and be able to see a hero figure have and experience those things. It normalizes it. It welcomes it. It affirms us. Um, and we'll have our moment of discovery. We'll have our moment of achievement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where I realized um, when we love and adore the same stories, like at comic conventions, at a Star Wars convention, um, that's where we can talk very openly about our mental health and how um, the stories can help us through our mental well-being journeys. Absolutely. That, yeah, that's this is such a cool way to view it and to use that. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Such a relatable picture of that. And it's funny, I, but I never put it together. I've watched those, you know, I, like I said, I've never gotten through Star Wars, but I've never, I don't know that I've thought through it as deeply as you have. What is, so good, you know, for yeah, you, yeah. So for you, is it that you were into Star Trek instead of Star Wars or were you just into other genres altogether? I don't know that I, like for me, you were talking about the lean in or lean out. I think that I am by default a lean out. Like I don't know that I, I'm trying to think of how to frame it, but I don't know that I ever feel like I'm a super inquisitive person. Like like I'm I'm inquisitive about learning about things and people, but as far as consumption of books or media, I don't know how much, except for with people, but, but other right. than people, I don't know right. that I ever, I never am that interested. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's always a very superficial experience for me. And I, I am envious of people that are able to slow down and really digest, like get all in on something. But I just, yeah. I, I sort of float around. I just don't ever. You're not alone. Um, there is a parasocial relationship scale um, that's uh -huh. available. You can Google it and it's like, I don't know, a 10 point scale or something. And some people are on one side of the spectrum where they easily get lost into a mediated relationship yeah, and will continue to explore their story and think about their story after the story's done. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some people in the middle and then some people on the other side where they see the value for the, for the story, but they're not going to take it with them after they press stop on right. their VCR, on yeah, their streaming right. channel or pause it, right? Or, or um, click out of Netflix or whatever. And, and so there's a range of experiences in our interactions with media. Um, but mm -hmm. I think something that you said it, that really speaks to me is that people are stories. Mm -hmm. um, now they're not fictional stories, but they're well-rounded, dynamic, um, beginning, middle, end stories that that keeps your attention for sure. Right. Yeah. I, and I will think of the same, like I will think about people after the yeah. conversation, but for some reason I have a harder, yeah, I must be lower on that scale and always have been and always envious of people you know, like I, that were interested in Marvel or whatever it might be. It's just, man, different, but yeah. I, I totally see the value um, in like what a cool way for you to have through your career shared, like used it as a platform to share about psychology. I, I mean, like I, I would imagine like you're able to hit so many different just demographic, like the, the, the range of demographics you're able to share information with, uh, I think is awesome. Thank so you. What, yeah. So what happens where, what is Drea doing and like, what do you, how is this going to evolve for you? How does it evolve? Um, yeah. What do you want to do? This is, it's, it, you know, we we're dealing with, um, a lot of tough aspects of the profession of psychology, especially clinical psychology and counseling psychology. Um, I, I am mindful and um, appreciative that a lot of us are going through a recovery period after this pandemic and trying to build back our own um, sense of identities, belongingness, mm -hmm. um, and resilience. And so I'm practicing that with myself too, not to get too overwhelmed with uh, making sure that I'm uh, actively in the hustle. Mm -hmm. um, but there are things I think about, you know, I want to work more with entertainment media companies. I do workshops, coaching, advising, 
um, not, not specifically toward making this connection between mediated stories and our mental health, um, but bringing a lot of our workplace wellness to areas, um, companies, nonprofits, teams that could really benefit from this work. And mm -hmm. more and more, I'm realizing that uh, there are a lot of places where that kind of well-being work, that health consciousness, that health education could really go a long way. So we're seeing these articles about quiet quitting and mm -hmm. um, burnout reduction and rejection. I even read an article where someone said they didn't want to go to graduate school because it's unsustainable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, the type of salary that it's not, I can't even call it a salary. It's a oh, stipend. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was horrified to learn that it's the same amount that I got in 2005. Um, just that is crazy. terrible, right? So, yeah. so I, I think that's a way to say, you know, we, I, I'm mindful that we're recovering, but also I feel like a call to action. How, how can I participate actively in that recovery? Yeah. It's a loaded question because I have an idea for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, I think this is such a cool way to, have you seen the, the, uh, what's the animated movie? Oh my God. What's the, the, the one where the, there's the, the girl and she's got inner, it's, it's like inside out. Yes. You seen inside out. Yes, I have. Yeah. And that has for my kids, for me and my kids been such a good way for me to try and help them understand their emotions. I thought that was a wonderful, it's a beautiful story. movie. And what a good way to help a child understand what they're thinking. And, but why not? There has, there should be a curriculum using comic book characters in elementary school to help people understand psychology and the importance of mental health and how you become more resilient. You should, there should, is there, you should do that. You <laughs> should create the, a curriculum. This is the, um, I kind of would say, and I totally agree with you. I, I think that um, it's exciting and necessary to buck the existing educational system and to dismantle a little bit of those past ways and increase creativity and learning and development. Um, I, I, I try to do that at UCLA as a trainer and, and coach there around how to teach people about resilience, mental health and, and psychology. Uh, I taught a class, a college course actually on how, um, how we can learn psych 101 from mm -hmm. um, from fictional stories. So there is something to that. I, I think that's an area that that excites me. Um, I I'm not sure because uh, I hear you saying what if there's a what if there's sort of a, a curriculum that could be used and passed on and and and, and scaled right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I'm I like that. Uh, and I also. I'm not sure if that would be widely accepted, right? Um, yeah, but I yeah, agree it with may, that. It may, it. it may not. Be, you're probably right that it would be. I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's reasons not to do it. But I just. I think what you're doing is just very cool. And the more you. that you could, just you know, just. I think you're just making it very digestible for people. I, I appreciate that so much. Right. And and to affirm your suggestion. Um, I would say, yes, I'd love to do that, but let me do it for free and let me, let me do it online so that it, whether it's a podcast or an online curriculum or, or, you know, whatever medium or platform that it's available to as many people as possible and not just through a specific partnership or through, uh -huh. a, a, you know, uh -huh. sorry, or through a paid, uh, a, 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 a behind a, a paid wall. Right. Right. You, you, I feel like you're a very good person. You're a better person than I, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, but you're, you're right. That's if you wanted to make it accessible to everybody, that's what you'd have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. there's still, yeah, there's still some, some ideas and opportunities there. Um, but I appreciate this conversation and yeah, thank you so much for yeah. taking the time. I really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll all stay in so touch happy with you. To be on. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. And, and what you're doing with this show, it excites me too, because you're welcoming diverse, um, thoughts and innovators, builders, you know, uh, um, folks who are doing interesting things in this field. And it's an honor to be a part of, of that well, conversation. Thank you. Yeah.